prior to the 19th century. It was thought that Genesis of the Old Testament contained the oldest material of literature in the entire known world. In particular, the narratives about the Great Flood and the Tower of Babel. Sometime during the 19th century, archaeologists, in an effort to find the cities mentioned in the Bible, found something completely different and far more fascinating. What they found all over Mesopotamia are cuneiform tablets. Some of these tablets predated the biblical timeline of creation itself, and the contents of these tablets were shocking. In 1961, Samuel Noah Kramer, a seriologist, translated a text known as Anki in the World Order, which seems to be a textual ancestor to the Tower of Babel story. Here's what it says. Today, we're embarking on a captivating expedition into the heart of ancient mythology and biblical lore, delving deep into the tales of the enigmatic Anunnaki and the mysterious Nephilim. The Anunnaki, powerful deities from ancient Sumerian mythology, are said to have shaped our world, influenced kings, and controlled the fate of humanity. Their stories have fascinated us, leading to varied interpretations and even some modern controversial conspiracy theories. And then there are the Nephilim, the giants of the Old Testament, the sons of God, fallen angels, mighty warriors, heroes of old, or perhaps all of the above. Their brief but intriguing mention in the Bible have given rise to countless interpretations and debates. Are there connections between these two groups of ancient beings? Were they celestial? terrestrial or maybe even extraterrestrial today we separate fact from fiction and history from myth guided by archaeology linguistics and the valuable work of countless scholars so buckle up and join us on this exciting journey into the realm of the anunnaki and the nephilim it's time to uncover the secrets of the ancients let's dive in The Anunnaki are a group of deities that appear in the mythological traditions of ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. They are among the earliest pantheons in Mesopotamian mythology. In Sumerian textual corpus, the term Anunnaki often refers to deities in the broadest sense. However, more specifically, it often designates a group of gods associated with the underworld where they are said to decree the fates of humanity. One of the significant mythological narratives involving the Anunnaki is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the world's oldest known works of literature. In the Epic, Gilgamesh meets the spirit of his friend Enkidu in the Underworld, where the Anunnaki act as judges in the Underworld who set laws for the cosmos. Gilgamesh lamented. Seven days and seven nights he wept for Enkidu, until the worm fastened on him. Only then he gave him up to the earth. For the Anunnaki, the judges, had seized him. Tablet 8, Epic of Gilgamesh. Then, in Tablet 9 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it says, The sleeping and the dead how alike are they? They are like a painted death. What is there between the master and the servant when both have fulfilled their doom? When the Anunnaki, the judges, come together and Mamitun, the mother of destinies, together they decree the fates of men. Life and death they allot, but the day of death they do not disclose. Finally, in Tablet 11, we get the story of the Great Flood sent by Enlil. 
which says, The Anunnaki lifted up the torches, setting the land ablaze with their flare. Stunned shock over Adad's deeds overtook the heavens and turned to blackness all that had been light. The land shattered like a pot. All day long, the south wind blew, blowing fast, submerging the mountain in water, overwhelming the people like an attack. No one could see his fellow. They could not recognize each other in the torrent. The gods were frightened by the flood and retreated, ascending to heaven of Anu. The gods were cowering like dogs, crouching by the outer wall. Ishtar shrieked like a woman in childbirth. The sweet-voiced mistress of the gods wailed. The olden days have a loss turned to clay because I said evil things in the assembly of the gods. How could I say evil things in the assembly of the gods, ordering a catastrophe to destroy my people? No sooner have I given birth to my dear people than they'll fill the sea like so many fish. The gods of the Anunnaki were weeping with her. The gods humbly sat weeping, sobbing with grief, their lips burning, parched with thirst. Six days and seven nights came the wind and flood, the storm flattening the land. When a seventh day arrived, Utna pushed him, sent forth a dove and released it. The dove went off. I, Utna Pishtim, sent forth a dove and released it. The dove went off, but came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. I sent forth a swallow and released it. The dove went off, but came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. I sent forth a raven and released it. The raven went off and saw the water slithered back. Now compare that text to the genesis of Noah and the flood. After 40 days, Noah opened up a window. He had made in the ark and sent out a raven and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. In both cases, Noah and Utnapushtim are told by a god to build an ark, load it with animals, and they both wait an additional seven days after the flood to send off doves and ravens to check for land. Now I bring this up because I think it's possible that the Nephilim in Genesis 6 may very well be influenced by the Anunnaki, the sons of God who endured the wrath of the king of the gods. But it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. And I will speak more about the Nephilim later. But let's talk about the Anunnaki first. The Anunnaki have also been connected to the creation of humanity, where they are said to have created humans to serve as laborers for the gods. This particular narrative is found in later Akkadian and Babylonian mythology, especially the Arterhasis, an Akkadian Babylonian epic that recounts the creation of humanity. The story goes that Anunnaki, together with the Ijiji, another group of gods, were burdened with the laborious tasks of digging canals and farming land to feed themselves and the other gods. The Ajiji, who were doing most of the work, rebelled. As a solution, the god Enki proposed the creation of humans to perform the labor instead. Thus, humans were created 
from clay and the blood of a slain god. The Enuma Elish, another Akkadian Babylonian creation epic, tells a similar tale of human creation. In this narrative, the god Marduk, after defeating the primeval goddess Tiamat, creates the world and humans. The Anunnaki, in this context, are considered high-ranking deities in the divine hierarchy. In these stories, the Anunnaki play roles as cosmic legislators, creators, and sometimes intermediaries between humans and the divine. They are integral to the functioning of the cosmos in the human society. Unto Kingu hath Tiamat entrusted, in costly raiment she has made him sit, saying, I have uttered thy spell in the assembly of the gods. I have raised thee to power. The dominion over all the gods I have entrusted unto thee. Be exalted, my chosen spouse. May they magnify thy name over all of them. The Anunnaki. Tiamat hath given the Kingu the tablets of destiny. On his breast she laid them, saying, Thy command shall not be without a veil, and the word of thy mouth shall be established. Enuma Elish, Tablet 3. The mythology of the Anunnaki is complex and spans several ancient cultures, with the earliest accounts coming from the Sumerians. Their stories, like many ancient mythologies, attempt to explain the origin of the world, the nature of the gods, and humanity, and the laws that govern existence. In Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki were initially viewed as celestial deities associated with various aspects of life and nature. However, the term Anunnaki gradually came to be associated more specifically with Chthonic underworld deities. In Mesopotamian mythology, the term Anunnaki was used to refer to deities in general, but it was mostly associated with the underworld, the realm of the dead. This does not necessarily imply a negative or punitive association. In many ancient cultures, the world was perceived as a multi-tiered structure, often divided into heavens, earth, and underworld. Gods and goddesses were assigned to different realms based on their roles and functions. The Anunnaki are depicted in various myths as judges in the underworld, ruling over the fate of the dead. For instance, the goddess Ereshkigal, the queen of the underworld, and Nergal, the god of death and plague, were both considered part of the Anunnaki. The reason why many of the Anunnaki are associated with the underworld is likely related to the Sumerians' belief about life, death, and the afterlife. The underworld, known as Kur or Irkala, was considered a dreary, dark place where the spirits of the dead existed in a shadowy version of the earthly life, similar to Hades in Greek mythology sustained by libations and offerings from the living. The Anunnaki, in their role as Chthonic deities, were seen as intermediaries between the world of the living and the world of the dead, with the power to judge and rule over souls of deceased humans. The term Anunnaki could include a wide range of deities, reflecting the complex and multifaceted nature of Mesopotamian religious belief. So what about the Nephilim? Why do so many think they are related? The Nephilim are depicted in biblical traditions as the offspring of the sons of God or fallen angels and are described as giants. In general, the Anunnaki and the fallen angels who give birth to the Nephilim are separate entities from distinct cultural and religious contexts, Mesopotamian mythology and Hebrew religion, respectively. However, there are some parallels. Both undergo the wrath of God and try to teach humans knowledge. Both the Anunnaki and the fallen angels are seen as powerful beings with the ability to influence humanity. The Anunnaki as those of royal blood or princely offspring were considered gods who decreed the fates of humanity. Similarly, 
fallen angels and certain interpretations are thought to have interacted with humans, sometimes negatively, as misleading spirits, but also in some narratives, teaching humanity various arts and knowledge. The Book of Enoch, an ancient Jewish religious work, ascribes the origins of sin and corruption on earth to a group of angels known as the Watchers, who fell from grace by mating with human women and teaching humanity forbidden knowledge. But rather than the Anunnaki, this story shares more elements with the myth of the Apkalu, seven wise men or demigods in Mesopotamian mythology who were created by the god Enki to establish culture and give civilizations to mankind. While there are thematic similarities and overlaps, it's essential to recognize that these myths and traditions develop independently with their own cultural and historical context. The connection between the Anunnaki and the fallen angels is not direct in their original mythologies. I would refrain from calling it a one-to-one -one comparison, but an indirect, passed-down mythology that changes in context of time and region. Both the Anunnaki from Mesopotamian mythology and these fallen angels or watchers from the Book of Enoch represent supernatural beings who have significant interactions with humanity. In both mythologies, there is a theme of divine or semi-divine beings interacting with humanity, often resulting in significant changes in society. The Anunnaki are said to have had an important role in the creation and early history of humanity often portrayed as teachers or rulers. In a similar manner, the fallen angels in the Book of Enoch are said to have descended to Earth and had children with human women, creating Nephilim, and they also taught humanity various forms of knowledge, some which led to negative consequences. In both mythologies, these interactions can lead to transgressions against the divine order and subsequent punishments. For example, some interpretations of the myth of the Apkalu, the seven wise demigods, suggest about the last of the Apkalu was considered evil. Barosus the Chaldean mentions these Apkalu long before the discovery of the cuneiform tablets, and he says they are led by a god named Oannes, who was half fish and half man, and taught humanity the creation of the cosmos and how to make fire and weapons. This is reflected in the fallen angels myth of the Watchers teaching humans how to make fire and weapons. The Watchers in the Book of Enoch are portrayed as transgressing divine boundaries by mating with human women and teaching forbidden knowledge, actions which lead to their punishment and the Great Flood. Both sets of beings have a significant impact on human civilization. The Anunnaki were seen as those who decreed the fates and were involved in the establishment of maintenance of civilization. The Watchers, through their transgressions, fundamentally altered the course of human history, bringing about a rise in civilization and its eventual punishment and destruction through the Flood. The stories of the Anunnaki from Mesopotamian mythology and the Titans from Greek mythology are distinct and originated from different cultural and historical contexts. However, like the fallen angels, the Greek mythology has some parallels as well, primarily in terms of power dynamics and generational conflicts among deities. Both the Anunnaki and the Titans are often associated with the primordial times. In Mesopotamian mythology, Anunnaki are among the earliest gods linked with creation of the world and the establishment of civilization, just as the Titans played the same role as they are replaced by the Olympian gods when Zeus overthrows Kronos, just as the old gods are replaced by the new gods in Mesopotamian mythology. In the mythologies of the Hurrians and Hittites, which flourished in the mid to late second millennium BC. The oldest generation of gods was believed to have been banished 
by the younger gods to the underworld, where they were ruled by the goddess Lelwani. Hittite scribes identified these deities with the Anunnaki. In ancient Hurrian, the Anunnaki are referred to as Keruleshinesh, which means former ancient gods, or Katuresh Shuanesh, which means gods of the earth. Hittite and Hurrian treaties were often sworn by the old gods in order to ensure that the oaths would be kept. In one myth, the gods are threatened by the stone giant Uli Kumi, so Ia, the later name for Enki, commands the former gods to find the weapon that was used to separate the heavens from the earth. They find it and use it to cut off Ulukumi's feet. Although the names of the Anunnaki in Hurian and Hittite texts frequently vary, they are always eight in number. Similarly, in Greek mythology, the Titans are the children of Uranos, heaven, and Gaia, earth, just as the Anunnaki are the children of Anu and Ki, also heaven and earth. In both mythologies, there is a theme of conflict or tension between generations of gods. The Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, tells of how the god Marduk of the younger generation defeats Tiamat, an ancient goddess often associated with the Anunnaki and becomes the king of the gods. Similarly, in Greek mythology, there's the Titanomachia, a 10-year war where the Olympians, the younger generation of gods, overthrows the Titans, the older generation. Both of these myths relate to the establishment of cosmic order and the allocation of divine roles. After Marduk's victory in the Enuma Elish, he creates the world and assigns roles to the gods. After the Titans defeat, in the Titanomachia, Zeus and his siblings divide the cosmos among themselves and establish their rule over the universe. The mythology of the Anunnaki has indeed influenced later civilizations, most notably Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, as well as the Hittites and the Greeks, all of whom inherited much of Sumer's cultural and religious legacy. These civilizations not only adopted the Anunnaki into their pantheons, but also developed and transformed their myths over time. A prominent example would be Marduk, originally a minor god in the Sumerian pantheon, who was elevated by the Babylonians to the status of chief deity. Marduk is often associated with Anu, the Sumerian sky god, and Enlil, who was initially considered the head of the Sumerian pantheon. The succession of the gods, like Zeus, Kronos, and Uranos, seems apparent throughout these cultures. Moreover, the motif of a group of important deities deciding the fates can be seen in many other ancient Near Eastern and Mediterranean mythologies, such as Egyptian, Greek, and Roman pantheons. While it's not a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, these similarities suggest cultural exchanges and shared archetypal ideas in ancient civilizations. The Nephilim are mentioned briefly in the Hebrew Bible, specifically in the book of Genesis 6 and Numbers 13. Their origins and nature, however, are somewhat cryptic and have been the subject of much debate and speculation. In Genesis, the Nephilim are described as the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of humans. The exact identity of these sons of God is not clear. Interpretations range from fallen angels to descendants of Seth, Adam and Eve's third son, while the daughters of humans are generally thought to refer to mortal women. The Nephilim are said to be the heroes of old, warriors of renown, indicating their extraordinary strength or abilities. They are often depicted as giants, especially in later Jewish or Christian tradition. In the book of Numbers, the term Nephilim, used again when the Israelites send spies into Canaan and they report back. So they brought the Israelites 
an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakites come from Nephilim. And ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. This passage is often interpreted to suggest that the Nephilim were giant beings, but it's also possible that the term here is used more symbolically to describe formidable enemies. The mysterious nature of the Nephilim have led to numerous interpretations and theories. The term Nephilim comes from the Hebrew root Nephil, which means to fall. Therefore, Nephilim is often translated as the fallen ones. This has led interpretations of the Nephilim as fallen angels or their offspring. However, the word could also be related to the Aramaic word Nephil or Nephilim, which means giants, reflecting the tradition of the Nephilim as giant beings in many later Jewish and Christian texts. The term's ambiguity in the biblical text, its rare use, and the various interpretive traditions have led to many different translations and interpretations. It's important to note that while we can make educated guesses based on linguistic and historical context, the precise meaning of Nephilim in the Bible is not definitively known. And even with these parallels, it must also be stressed that the Anunnaki and the Nephilim are a part of two distinctive ancient cultural traditions, Mesopotamian and Hebrew. there isn't a direct connection between the two in their original context. If that was the case, then why wouldn't the Hebrew authors just call them Anunnaki? Why call them Nephilim? They are separate entities within their respective cultures and religious traditions. The Anunnaki were deities who in different Mesopotamian cultures held various roles from being the high gods of the pantheon to the Chthonic underworld deities. On the other hand, the Nephilim according to the Hebrew Bible, are the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of humans, often depicted as giants or mighty warriors. The interpretation of the Anunnaki as deities of the ancient Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians is well established in historical and archaeological research. However, in recent years, the Anunnaki have taken on a new life in the realm of pseudo-archaeology, conspiracy theories, and science fiction. For example, the ancient astronaut theory proposed by Zechariah Sitchin in his Earth Chronicles argues that the Anunnaki were actually a race of extraterrestrial beings from the planet Nibiru who visited Earth in search of gold over 400,000 years ago. According to Sitchin, these beings genetically engineered Homo sapiens as a worker race to mine gold. Zechariah Sitchin also posits that the Anunnaki were a race of extraterrestrial beings who visited Earth and genetically engineered humans. For over a half a century, biblical scholar and Near East historian Zechariah Sitchin devoted his life to proving the link between human beings and the Nephilim, giants, mentioned in the book of Genesis. Sitchin's research identifies them as ancient aliens known as the Anunnaki, who came to Earth from the planet Nibiru. Excuse me, my teacher, uh, why do you say giants when the word in Hebrew is Nephilim? Uh, coming from the root Nephol, which means to come down, to descend. And uh, I was expecting uh, to be complimented uh, by the teacher, where she said something like, sit, in, sit down, you don't question the Bible. Many of the seal impressions that we have that are so significant to seeing how things were depicted in those days, be it humans or gods, come from these envelopes. Well, we have arrived at Haran, the city where Abraham dwelt with his father and brother and nephew. It's important to emphasize that these interpretations are not accepted by mainstream historians, archeologists, or experts in Mesopotamian mythology. They are often criticized for a lack of rigorous scholarship 
misinterpretations of ancient texts, and a reliance on unsupported speculations. Here, sophisticated technology and structures like the pyramids, and that these are not tombs, but also advanced technology. There's a lack of empirical evidence to support any of these claims. If such advanced technologies were used in ancient times, we would expect to find physical remnants or unambiguous depictions of this technology in ancient artifacts and primary sources. No such evidence has been found. The theory reflects a modern bias that ancient civilizations lack the capability to build monumental architecture or develop complex societies on their own. This underestimates the capability of our ancestors. Archaeologists have demonstrated that ancient societies had the knowledge, skills, and organization to construct monumental architecture and develop complex civilizations without the need for extraterrestrial invention. These ancient astronaut theorists tend to operate outside the standard methodologies and principles of historical and archaeological research, often prioritizing sensational interpretations over more plausible ones and tend to dismiss contrary evidence. This approach does not follow the principles of scientific inquiry, which require hypotheses to be based on empirical evidence and to be testable and falsifiable. While the ancient astronauts theory might be intriguing, it does not hold up under scrutiny. The Anunnaki, as understood by mainstream historians and archaeologists, were deities in the ancient Mesopotamian pantheon, not extraterrestrial beings. Our understanding of the Anunnaki, like many aspects of ancient civilization, is continually refined through ongoing scholarly research and archaeological discovery. And that, dear explorers, concludes our thrilling journey into the ancient world of the Anunnaki and the Nephilim, two intriguing chapters from the vast book of human mythology and ancient narratives. We've traveled through the fertile plains of Mesopotamia, scaled the Tower of Babel, and stood in the shadow of biblical giants, all in our quest for understanding true gnosis. We've seen that while these ancient stories are separated by cultures and centuries, they continue to captivate us with their enduring mysteries. They spark our curiosity, challenge our understanding and fuel our imagination. And though some attempt to connect these mythologies in surprising, controversial ways, what's clear is the impact that these narratives have had in our collective human story. As always, our quest for Gnosis never ends. There are countless more mysteries waiting to be unraveled and an endless number of stories to be told. We're grateful to have you accompany us on these exciting explorations as we continue to delve into the fascinating tales of the past. I hope you enjoy this journey and are eager for more. Make sure you hit that like button, share this video with your fellow history enthusiasts. More importantly, share this video to your friend who's an Ancient Aliens fan, a Graham Hancock fan, or a Zachariah Sitchin fan. Your support allows us to continue creating content, also educating people, and we hope inspires as well. Join us next time as we'll uncover more intriguing pieces of human history and mythology. What mysteries await us? You'll have to just tune in and find out or drop a comment on what you want to see covered next. Until then, keep exploring, stay curious, and remember, history is often far more thrilling than fiction. Thank you for watching, and you have just attained true gnosis.